Welcome back to the Talking Hedge, your cannabis business podcast. I'm Josh Kincaid. This week, we're going to dive into some exchange traded funds or ETFs, cannabis stock updates, and investing in cannabis, which stocks might be right for you, banking in cannabis, as well as cryptocurrency, how to money launder, beyond cash and the future of security and cannabis, things to consider when selling your cannabis business, data, consolidation, purchasing cannabis property. We'll dive into five cannabis questions researchers and producers are asking in 2019, and six hottest cannabis products in 2019. After a strong January and February, the cannabis sector put one of its worst weekly performances in 2019 last week. The broader equities market declined after a weak jobs report. The S&P 500 reported its first weekly drop since January. Investors should properly reduce their risk exposure, for example, cannabis stocks, as uncertainty remains high in the market. Cannabis stocks followed the broader equities market down last week. Horizon's Marijuana Life Sciences Index ETF lost 2.6%, and ETFMG Alternative Harvest dropped 3.9% last week. The large cap performances were influenced by Jeffries and Cohen initiating coverage on several stocks. Tilray dropped 12% after Jeffries initiated with an underperformance rating and a $61 target price. Aurora gained 5.6% after Cohen called it a top pick with a $14 price target. And Kronos was flat after it closed the $2.4 billion investment from Altria parent company of Philip Morris, who is officially in the game as the largest shareholder of Kronos. Afria was down 5.8% despite becoming a fully licensed as its entire Afria One facility, and Canopy dropped 3.5% without any major news. Unlike other industries you've invested in, cannabis is rife with scale inhibiting regulations, founders with potential black marks on their records, and a change rate that can leave portfolio companies in the dust. Make sure to do your due diligence on your fund of choice. Everybody seems to be jumping out of the woodworks wanting to invest in cannabis. So if you're interested in profiting from pot, you can consider an exchange traded fund or ETF versus individual stocks. ETFs pull together money from many investors so that you can own many stocks. Therefore, an ETF provides a simple way to gain a broad exposure to pot stocks. However, ETFs do have drawbacks. Marijuana ETFs must be bought through a broker, so you pay a commission each time you buy or sell. Also, you'll pay annual fees, usually expressed as a percentage of assets to the company managing the ETF. Furthermore, ETFs can buy or sell stocks more frequently than you might want, causing unexpected capital gains taxes. ETFs give you more diversification, but individual stocks allow you to invest in the companies in which you want the most interest. If you hold your stocks for longer than one year, buying individual stocks can limit your capital gains taxes too. And you won't pay a management fee if you buy individual stocks on your own, but you'll still pay commissions when you buy and sell individual stocks. And the risk can be great if you invest in a stock that drops. Your loss is a lot more if you lose money. Think about it, if you invest $1 and the stock market drops 50%, you're left with 50 cents. But if the stock market goes back up 50%, you still only have 75 cents. Something to think about. Investors should also know that most cannabis stocks don't trade on the major U.S. stock exchanges. Marijuana companies listed on major exchanges can't do business where it's illegal at the federal level. So cannabis companies are either avoiding the U.S. market or choosing to hold off on listing their shares on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. As a result, the company you might want to buy could be listed at the less regulated over-the-counter or OTC market, or it might be available on foreign exchange, such as the Toronto Stock Exchange. OTC stocks aren't subject to the same same strict financial requirements as stocks listed on other major exchanges. OTC stocks can be volatile because of limited trading volume and narrow price transparency. You may have to get special permissions from your brokerage to buy foreign stocks, and trading them means accepting currency exchange risks that can take a bite out of your profit. Typically, if a stock is five digits and ends in F, it's uh, an ADR or an American Depository Receipt. So five digits ending in F means that it's probably not DTC eligible. Depository Trust and Clearing Corp is what makes transfer of stocks happen much more quickly. And so if you can't use electronic transfer for settlement, you literally have to do a paper physical settlement. And that's going to cost $75 on the buy and sell side. So if you buy a penny stock, it might cost you $150. 
Most brokerage firms are going to set that to block, or if they missed it, it's set to real-time sell, which means if you do have it, you can only sell it. You can't buy more of it. Companies that are on the OTC and don't file appropriately are going to have a caveat and tour or buyer beware stamped on them because you don't have that transparency. Um, but in other regards, even if you are on the up and up, you're not going to have your stock available to buy and sell, which is going to drastically reduce your volume. Without volume, you can't increase your market cap and that velocity of money stops. And so you kind of need that train to keep going. So it's kind of important to be DTC eligible and off the OTC because the larger exchanges have a lot more credibility, essentially. That said, this drawback may become less of a problem for individual stock investors in the future. A handful of companies targeting the cannabis market outside the U.S. listed their shares on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ in 2018, and more companies could follow suit, especially if they focus on hemp, which is no longer a Schedule One substance in the U.S. Despite the size of the opportunity associated with the legalizing $150 billion in global cannabis sales, marijuana investing isn't for the faint of heart. The industry is only now emerging, and many of the companies angling for market share today may wind up falling shy of the sky-high predictions, or worse, going bankrupt. Nevertheless, the potential here is significant enough to warrant investors' attention. Just make sure you're willing to do your homework. You want to thoroughly understand the industry and the companies you're interested in owning before you buy. Cannabis can be a lucrative industry if you invest correctly, so which stocks are right for you? Let's take a deeper look and see if you're ready to dip your toes in the cannabis market. The cannabis industry has been on the rise for years, and according to many experts, the industry is poised for another huge year in 2019 and could be worth $147 billion by 2025. Even parts of the industry that currently have more potential than actual real-world applications like CBD-infused drinks have attracted the attention of industry giants like Coca-Cola and Pepsi, and predicted the 600 million market by 2022. Big Tobacco has even invested in the cannabis market with Marlboro's parent company Altria pumping a massive $1.8 billion investment into Kronos Group, a Canadian company that focuses on rare cannabinoids. Obviously, the market is looking bright, very, very profitable for those smart enough to invest now. So which types of cannabis stocks is right for you? When it comes to cannabis stocks, there's three major categories you want to consider before investing. You want to keep in mind that sometimes subtle and important differences between them. For growers, the first are growers, probably the most simple and straightforward of the three. Unsurprisingly, growers are companies that cultivate the cannabis itself from seed to sale, then either sell directly to consumers or wholesale to other cannabis businesses for use in their products. Due to factors like the continued federal illegality of cannabis in the United States, the ceiling on U.S. companies is much lower than companies in Canada, for example, where recreational cannabis is legal nationwide. Cannabis growth is the biggest player in this space, boasting a massive market cap of more than $15 billion. They're the leading supplier of medical cannabis in Canada and have positioned themselves as a major player in Germany after they approve medical cannabis. While cannabis is a great option if you're looking to invest, most of the stocks in the grower category rely on the continued march towards full legalization. If that were too slow for any reason due to the administrative change or some other unforeseen issues, investors might be stuck between a rock and a hard place on this one. If the current trend, trend towards full legalization in the very near future does continue, however, it's worth buying into the grower now. When legalization comes, they'll be experiencing a historic boom. In biotechs, there's companies you hear about that are leading the research into cannabinoids and working to find medical links between cannabis industry and pharmaceuticals. These companies frequently work with synthetic derivatives of the organic compounds found in cannabis for treatments of all types of diseases and pain management. The momentum of cannabis as medicine, particularly as a viable solution to opiates, is undeniable, and there's so much potential for investors in this space. A major player in the cannabinoid industry is the British company GW Pharmaceuticals, a company with cannabinoid products that are already out on the market and a massive market cap of $5.2 billion. That huge valuation comes from the potential in the, of an FDA-approved CBD-based prescription drug called Epidiolex, which can be used to treat two rare, severe forms of epilepsy in children. And I also heard it's $35,000. While Epidiolex may have gotten FDA approval, there are outliners. Generally, obtaining FDA approval is a massive stumbling block when it comes to cannabinoid research. It's hard for companies to study and produce innovation in CBD space while funding is difficult to come by due to federal illegality. 
And just like the previous entry on the list, a major factor in the success of cannabis biotech companies is the progressive march towards full legalization. For investors, it's a non-brainer to invest in an alternative to the destructive and addictive opiates that so many Americans use for pain management that could easily be handled by CBD-based products. Ancillary industries, which is the last type of stock that you can buy, isn't a part of the cannabis industry itself, but all of the products that supplement and support the industry. So for example, WikiLeaf is a tech company that doesn't touch any aspect of the plant whatsoever. Instead, they help consumers to learn about cannabis, find dispensaries and strains near them. Other ancillary businesses includes all of the things that you actually need to grow cannabis. After all, cannabis is just another plant, so it needs soil, fertilizers, pest control methods, watering systems, and light sources to grow, especially for massive grows and farms all over the country. A surprisingly aggressive big name in this space is Scott's miracle Grow. Yeah, the same company that puts ads all over the airwaves about fixing up your lawn, and also the company that's buying up small cannabis hydroponic companies. Those aggressive acquisitions are likely to ensure their subsidiary company, Hawthorne Gardening Company, as a leader in the hydroponic space and the preferred choice of cannabis retailers for supplies. While miracle Grow might not be the first company that comes to mind when you think about cannabis stocks, it's a relatively low-risk investment to buy into because of how high profit and profitability the company already is, while also having an incredible upside if full federal legalization were to come out. Sometimes the best investments are the least obvious ones that might want to fly under the radar with high-profile investors. So is now a good time to buy into cannabis stocks? While the cannabis industry is looking like it's about to blast off into the stratosphere financially, investors should keep in mind that there's some risks associated with it. While the industry as a whole is highly dependent on federal government scheduling changes and legalization, as well as supply and demand issues that have plagued both Canada and states like Oregon, there's no better time to invest in cannabis stocks in the present. The global demand for cannabis is changing and a wide majority of American approve for full recreational use. As more and more countries with large populations like Canada go full recreational legal and approve for medical cannabis like Germany and the UK, the more money gets pumped into the global cannabis industry. With more states on the way to legalize in 2019, the domestic market in the U.S. will undoubtedly grow as well. The future is looking bright for the budding cannabis industry, their stock, and their investors. Canada became the first major world economy and the second country after Uruguay to legalize recreational cannabis last October. Cannabis is getting official approval from many U.S. states for recreational use in addition to medical usages. Though pot remains entirely illegal at the federal level, Michigan approved a ballot measure during the midterm elections for recreational use of cannabis to become the 10th state while Missouri and Utah approved for legalization of medical marijuana. The total number of U.S. states greenlighting medical cannabis is now 33. As an evidence of strong demand in the U.S., pot companies have engaged in deals of late. Harvest Health and Recreation is acquiring closely held Chicago-based Verano Holdings for about $850 million in the largest U.S. pot deal, as reported by Bloomberg. The joint entity will have license to operate up to 200 facilities in 16 states and territories, including 123 retail dispensaries. This will make it one of the largest multi-state operators in the U.S., and the deal would allow Harvest to have more than 70 operating dispensaries, 13 cultivation facilities, and 13 manufacturing facilities by the end of 2019. If completed, the acquisition will mark the largest deal between two U.S.-focused pot companies, according to data compiled by Bloomberg. Notably, Harvest is the third largest U.S. cannabis firm. These aren't the first U.S. companies that are engaging in an M&A deal. In November, California-based cannabis retailer and producer Medmen had agreed to buy Chicago-based Pharmacan, a medical marijuana company, for $682 million. The idea is to grab land fast and have licenses to cultivate cannabis. Aurora Cannabis did the same thing in Canada and making several acquisitions in a short span. The idea behind this is to take the Canadian public marketplace and bring that cash back to the U.S. before legalization happens so that they can get those valuations at the lowest point possible while it's still quasi-illegal. State by state, it's legal, of course, and then federally, it's not. So that's why I say quasi. So all of these Canadian companies are legally coming in, buying hemp farms so that they can have their property, plant, and equipment and utilize 280E, which is a tax provision not allowed by cannabis companies. Hemp companies can do that. So while they coming, these companies are coming in from Canada and buying up hemp companies, they'll be able to fully utilize all the tax write-offs. So in the eventuality that cannabis becomes legal, they can flip that over into THC facilities and 
start working across uh, the country. Multi-state operators are the, the number one form of investment. Companies are wanting uh, vertically integrated operations, so producers, processors, and retailers to be in multiple states. The second driving investment vehicle is data, and then behind that is consumption lounges or cannabis cafes, which are still not widely legal yet, and a class C felony in Washington. Want to cash out of your cannabis business? Here's some things to consider. As mergers and acquisition activity accelerates across the cannabis industry, many companies are discovering that they don't need a for sale sign in the window in order to be a takeover target. The flurry of M&A activity, which is on pace to double in the cannabis industry this year, is giving more cannabis founders a chance to cash out at an attractive price after years of working 24-7 to build their businesses. It can also provide a founder with a hefty pot of cash to launch their next venture. As more companies become potential acquisition targets, here's some things businesses and their founders should consider before a buyer comes knocking on the door. Starting a competition among prospective buyers, building your company's brand, determining your business's worth, putting good corporate governance in place, hiring the right business broker. For the firms on the selling side, creating competition among prospective buyers is critical to commanding the best price. You can't allow a buyer to wait you out so you become a desperate seller. At the end of the day, you want this to be a very diligent process that stays in a timeline of, of finishing due diligence but creates a sense of urgency. That's how you can push to get a better price. Number two is building your brand. In a perfect world, you'd be able to uplist on the New York Stock Exchange and get investment banks behind you and truly capitalize on these companies. But right now, you have to stay flexible because that's a policy driven and something that you can't control. So we're either going to have to stand alone or try to position to be the most attractive takeover target there is. In the meantime, you can boost your firm's appeal by beefing up your brand. As the price of cannabis declines, brands are critical to commanding higher consumer demand and price. Product consistency and authenticity are key attributes to building a strong brand. You can embed your business and products in key markets that will be attracted to potential suitors. Once there, you can saturate the market. Number three is determining what your business is worth. It sounds simple, but it takes a lot of work. You need to price out the opportunity. What is your firm's potential cash flow? It's the line items acquirers are often most interested in. Accounts and business brokers can help you crunch these numbers by using common ratios that take into account the possible revenue multiple or profit multiple to price your company depending on the particular business sector. You can compare other deals. So if your firm is in a hot merger or an acquisition target, it's likely others in that sector are too. So take note of those deals involving companies comparable to your own. You build a network of investment bankers and brokers that are actively engaged in deals in your market. Network closely with other entrepreneurs and business owners in your sector. Talk up your company's valuation on a regular basis when speaking with investors and executives. The big mistake is to never talk about your worth and valuation when the surprise stakeholders bring it up. I would also add that the one of the biggest uh, mistakes is to have pre-money valuation in the millions of dollars. You have no brand if you have no sales. So if you think that you're worth one or $2 million because you have a cool logo and you have no sales, you're going to scare everybody away. So that valuation is incredibly important. Number four is putting good corporate government governance in place. So for companies actively seeking a buyer, having corporate governance basics in order is a must. You want to make sure that your lawyer is engaged and that there's, if there's any votes or actions or adjustments that for your financials, make sure everything is well documented. If not, it's a signal to an acquirer that something may be out of line. So a potential acquirer will likely pause if the following controls or considerations are unaccounted for. So you need to have updated audited financials. You want to avoid creating headaches for your potential acquirer by having your financial house in order. That includes up-to-date balance sheets and audited financials. Your corporate governance controls, you need to be prepared to show that you have strong controls in place, including updated board minutes, documentations of all board votes and decisions, and have good shareholder communications, whether you have a wide shareholder base or a large shareholder. Be prepared to show that you've been in regular contact with your key investments and shareholders. And number five is hiring the right business broker. Beyond the team of auditors, accountants, and attorneys needed to help craft your deal, a business broker can help be an invaluable asset. Be particularly choosy when hiring a business broker. Cannabis has legal and regulatory baggage that makes it different from any mainstream industry. Cannabis is not a normal market. 
It's a 30 plus market across the US that all have different laws to abide by. You really want somebody that has significant experience in this space and understands the challenges of buying and selling companies in this industry. When choosing a broker, ensure that the broker is licensed by the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, or FINRA, which governs best practices and regulates broker dealers. Seek experience. Consider the number of deals any broker has completed in the cannabis space, but be sure to ask to speak with past clients. And keep an eye on the cost. Be aware that most brokers require retainer fees that can range from $25,000 to $75,000, depending on the size of your firm. That can be in addition to success fees, which are paid out once the company is sold, and those range from 2 to 5%. Beyond creating comp competition among buyers, brokers are critical in helping to carry out the due diligence needed to ensure that potential acquirer is in the right fit and helping outline the deal structure to ensure that you get the best price. Cash up front is the most important factor. If they're offering stock, is it public or private? What carries the most value to you? Many buyers will push to work in certain benchmarks that trigger payment to a seller at the end of the deal. The structure of those considerations is critical some are questioning whether the cannabis company's profits are up in smoke. There's been some questionable accounting practices that have allowed cannabis companies to inflate their profits. Some cannabis companies do, in fact, make fairly reasonable assumptions in valuing these assets, given the guidelines they're working with. And price-to-earnings multiples are effectively meaningless for these companies. There's been a positive shift in financial reporting. However, there's concerns about how the International Financial Reporting Standards, or IFRS, can inflate profits. The issue with cannabis companies using these international standards is that the plants are still in the ground. They could perish in a drought, drown in rainstorms, be eaten by bugs. These are problems. And if any of these events were to occur, a company that looks profitable on paper could immediately lose all of its value. So these risks are present in every agricultural sector, but with cannabis, because it's such a new industry, there's often overlooked inconsistencies in the way that cannabis producers arrive at the fair market value of their crops. This was a big week for cannabis on the policy front as lawmakers introduced the Secure and Fair Enforcement or Safe Banking Act for 2019. A bipartisan bill was introduced that seeks to remove cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act, ending federal prohibition. Of course, the bill isn't perfect as it does prohibit some cultivation unless it's medical and most retail outlets would be run by the government, which of course opens the door to all kinds of inefficiencies and potential loss of revenue taxes. We've already seen evidence of this in states that only allow liquor sales through state-run retail outlets. Those outlets generate billions in tax revenues, but they also require operational costs such as leases and utilities. Privately run retail operations pay for all of these things, meaning that the end result is using just privately run retail outlets could even be more tax revenues for the state. N4 Financial Group, an independent investment bank advising on cannabis and mining deals, is preparing for a major shakeout in corporate credit as Canadian companies pile on too much debt. After more than 10 years without a major corporate failure, banks are aggressively expanding into corporate loans, adding to a debt pile built on the back of an ultra-low interest rate. Potential cracks have already started to show. Toronto Dominion Bank and Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, the country's second and fifth largest banks, bolstered provisions in the last fiscal quarter, citing a rise in corporate arrears among the reasons. Canadian companies' interest expenses almost doubled this decade. While in for restructuring activity takes off, investment banks in Canada may continue to see a steady flow of mergers among the mid-sized and small players in the cannabis industry. Cannabis advisors accounted for about a third of the bank's revenue last year, with the rest coming from mining, financial services, and then other sectors. For that to happen, there needs to be a closing of the current gap between the values that small players think that they're worth and what the large players are now willing to pick them up for. There's still a few mid-tier players that'll pick up Canadian assets and try to push them in the top 10. So it's really that the mid-tier producers buying small-tier producers above the $1 billion threshold that have the most activity is going to be focused globally and outside of Canada. Federal Chairman Powell says that banks are in a very difficult position with cannabis. In a testimony before the Senate Banking Committee on Tuesday, the Federal Reserve Chairman Jay Powell said clarity is needed on cannabis banking regulations, and he'd think it'd be a great to have that clarity. So cannabis was just one issue raised during the two days of hearing that delved in the U.S.'s economic backdrop. The subject wouldn't come up until roughly an hour and a half into the federal chairman's two-hour testimony when New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez broached the subject. 
Menendez sought answers regarding the security risk posed by a billion dollar industry operating entirely on cash due to federal regulations. Powell answered that he did not have any information to provide any clarity on the situation before adding his own desire for clarity on the matter. Financial institutions and the regulators and supervisors are in a very difficult position here with marijuana being illegal under federal law and, the, and legal under a growing number of state laws, Powell said. It puts financial institutions in a very difficult place and puts the supervisors in a difficult place too. It'd be very nice to have clarity on that supervisory relationship. Powell also said in response to Menendez that more clarity on insurance for marijuana businesses would also be helpful. The Fed chairman also fielded questions on matters such as tightening incomes in the labor force suggesting globalization would be a source of the concern. A California bill would legalize cryptocurrency for tax payments from cannabis related businesses. Lawmakers in the U.S. state of California have introduced a bill that would allow cannabis-related businesses to pay fees and taxes in stable coins. The bill is introduced by the California State Assembly on February 21st. The bill would authorize that city or county in determining that method to either accept stable coins directly into a digital wallet controlled by the jurisdiction or to utilize a third-party digital asset payment processor that allows for the immediate conversion of any payments made by stable coins into the U.S. dollars and deposit into an account of that jurisdiction. In 2017, the Dash Network began implementing Dash as a payment option in the cannabis industry's point of sale devices. In doing so, Dash reportedly aimed to save the industry 10 to 15% as a decreased flow of paper money will stymie the need for cash boxes, safes, and guards. Other US states have also introduced bills that would help tax payments in cryptocurrency. In January, legislators in the US uh, state of New Hampshire proposed a bill to accept Bitcoin for state payments. This bill requires that the state treasurer develop and implement a, the plan for the state to accept cryptocurrencies as payment for taxes and fees beginning July of 2020. So it feels like every week we learn about a former Wall Street executive or politician migrating into the cannabis industry from your former Mexican president, Vincent Fox, joining several marijuana companies to a former MTV executive taking over a CEO role. So this week we take a look at uh, Morgan Stanley to marijuana. Vinzan International, a Toronto-based cannabis trading company, will appoint Donald Stewart as its new chief financial officer. He leaves his executive director position at Morgan Stanley after 12 years with the company and was in charge of Morgan Stanley's Canadian International Trading Division. Vinzan International is in the process of building food and pharma-grade extraction facilities in Colombia and Southeast Asia, seeking to establish itself as a leader in the global cannabis market. Management is disclosed that they're targeting an IPO offering in 2019 and also runs a operation in Laos, Thailand, and Colombia. Let's say you're a criminal with millions of dollars in ill-gotten gains, but there's one problem. Transferring that money or carrying suitcases of cash will raise eyebrows, so you need to launder the dough and make that dirty money appear to be the proceeds of legitimate enterprise. So it can be spent anywhere around the world on real estate or luxury yachts with no questions asked. Most countries and all the major world's banks have controls in place to flag suspicious funds coming into financial systems. One way of money laundering is hiding under shell companies. UK-based shell companies are one way of doing it. As noted in the Panama Papers, you can have deliberately opaque shell companies which exist only on paper and have no active business operations. They're easily and cheap to set up and effective at obscuring ownership. So they're key to what experts are calling the layering phase of money laundering in which funds are shoveled around multiple times to make them harder to track. Shell companies are often found in traditional tax havens such as Switzerland, the Cayman Islands, which is British, and the U.S. of Delaware and Nevada are also permit corporations to be set up in anonymity. So the International Consortium of Journalists has uncovered the Troika laundromat scheme, it says it involved at least 75 shell companies that generated a total of $8.8 billion in transactions through made-up deals. There's been a global push for more transparency, even in the U.K., Number two is finding weak links. After the chaotic collapse of the Soviet Union, launderers searched out weak spots in Europe where watchdogs were, well, Ill, were ill-equipped. They looked for cannabis banks that might be poorly supervised or even open to be complacent. Torrents of cash were channeled through banks in Cyprus and Malta. Baltic nations of Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia all have central roles in the emerging tales of dirty Russian money, becoming big players as passageways to the West. The former Soviet states had an added draw because Russian is widely spoken. The Scandinavian leaders rushed to get into the high growth markets. By way of Western correspondent banks, funds could be further cleansed and moved around with less scrutiny. 
Denmark Bank has acknowledged that much of about 230 billion has flowed through its tiny Estonian outputs that may have been dirty. There's trade-based money laundering where criminals can move around funds across borders by engaging in seemingly legitimate international trading of goods and falsifying invoices to disguise their true value. Such trade-based laundering was key to the Troika laundromat scheme, where bogus invoices were allegedly used to trade food goods, metal goods, auto parts. So the method is widely used to enable outflows from developing countries. Global Financial Integrity, a Washington-based research organization, estimated that trade misinvoicing accounts for 18% of developing nations' trade with developed economies. Wow, one in every $5 is fraud from emerging markets to first world countries. Mirror trades have two stock transactions. So in two separate locations, effectively canceling out each other, but succeeding in moving money from one place to another. A mirror trade have legitimate uses. So they're employed by mutual funds and other investors that have limits on where they can hold securities. But such trades can also be used to bring money across borders. So in one infamous example, Deutsche Bank helped a client move $10 billion out of Russia from 2011 to 2015 by executing mirror transactions in its offices in Moscow and London. The bank was fined $629 million by the UK and US authorities for those compliance failures. A criminal investigation by the US Department of Justice has yet to conclude. Another technique, sometimes known as a back-to-back -back deal, is to take a loan in one country that's secured by a deposit in another. The launderer defaults on the loan, the bank seizes the deposit, and the money looks clean. The fact that both types of transactions have le legitimate applications makes them harder to stop. Mixing clean and dirty money is difficult to tell the difference between legitimate businesses and illicit flows from criminal activity. Launders sometimes work with real companies that generate lots of cash, managing their funds before they head back to the bank. So casinos and other cash banks operations, such as restaurants or attractive targets. A common scheme involving casinos is to buy large amounts of chips in cash, gamble just a tiny share, and then call the rest winnings and redeem the funds. Even more effective is owning the whole casino. Macau, the world's largest gambling hub, has long been beset by money laundering despite repeated attempts by China's government to rein it in. Canada found last year that casinos in British Columbia for years served unwittingly as laundromats for domestic and international crime. The expansion of online gaming and sports betting where identities are easy to conceal provide new opportunities as do cryptocurrencies. Smurfing is another way of money laundering. And to avoid raising red flags, money launders will break down a large amount of money into smaller chunks and have associates known as Smurfs deposit those funds in different accounts in different places. US banks are required to report to regulatory authorities any transaction more than $10,000. So launders often avoid hitting that limit. Banks must continuously track customer transactions to look for red flags. And if they have any good reason to suspect something devious, they must also alert authorities for a suspicious transaction report instead of a currency transaction report. Failure to do so can bring stiff fines. Banks often complain that the rules are difficult and too costly. Bankers are circling Europe's growing cannabis market. Investors who are eager for the cannabis industry in Europe to emulate the boom in pot stock listings in Canada may, may not have to wait much longer, judging by the activities of investment bankers. Canaccord Genuity, the biggest underwriter of stock offerings for cannabis-related companies, has appointed the head of European Cannabis Investment Banking. The French bank Brian Garnier in the past year started covering the cannabis sector via a Paris-based analyst. Jeffrey's Financial Group recently initiated coverage on a slew of North American pot stocks through a London-based analyst. The firms are laying the groundwork for an expected increase in stock sales and mergers and acquisitions as companies seek to capitalize on Europe's growing acceptance of cannabis, particularly for medical uses. There's been significant interest from medical companies for stock market listings in Europe. A lot of companies from all over the world are looking to raise capital in London. For now, the European market is basically uninvestable for managers of institutional equity funds. The region's biggest listed marijuana name is London Sativa Investments at about 26 million pounds or 33 million dollars. Canada is the definitive leader in the global pot industry. Witness Canopy Growth Corp 
with a market value north of 16 billion or more than 7 billion a piece for Tilray and Aurora cannabis. To be sure, it may be a good thing that the market has been slower to develop than in Canada, where recreational pot was legalized in October, because it means that the region avoids the market frenzy that hit North America last fall. The bubble, similar to the cryptocurrency craze before it, led some odd corporate events like the equipment rental company that's been trying to reinvest itself as a maker in the pot fused drinks. Investors have been encouraged by signs that the big food and drug companies are starting to explore cannabis, such as spirit companies, Constellation Brands, and Canopy Growth. The industry's visibility is increasing too. Cannabis consulting firm Hanaway Associates runs First Wednesdays, a networking event in London and Paris for people in the industry. About 30 people signed up for information on the events when they began in mid-2018 and now more than 500. Hanway is also involved in the Cannabis Europa Conference, which was held in Paris last month and will come to London in June. Bankers were among the first to get interested in the networking opportunities, having taken note of the situation in Canada. At the start, it was smaller financial outfits that were watching Canada. Now it's a mix of professional service firms, a lot of entrepreneurs, and a lot of financiers looking for big, the next big deal. For European companies, catching up to Canada's cannabis behemoths won't be easy. Success won't come cheap. The Canadian cannabis producers have a significant leg up on American and European companies. So to build a relationship and take advantage of an unexpected unification of trade across the block itself is come, going to take years. As far as many investors are concerned, medicinal cannabis is tainted both by its association with the recreational drug and by the comparisons being drawn by the dot-com boom and other cryptocurrency crazes. Time will tell as to how quickly those perceptions will fade and more meaningful volumes of cash become available. Beyond cash, the future of security in cannabis, does your business need a security risk assessment? As the cannabis industry moves towards the mainstream, it may be time for growers, retail establishments, and laboratories to consider formal physical security risk assessments. These assessments provide a way to identify large-scale risks to a company from criminal threats and supply chain tampering to consumer confidence and brand protection. They also address in-house issues like employee theft and inefficient practices at lower profits or increased costs. The key is finding ways to make a business safer while also protecting the culture that made it successful in the first place. Unfortunately, there's not one standard for security assessment across most industries. For some business owners, the security goals are simple, like meeting the local requirements necessary for licensing and permitting. But more developed industries know that security investing brings cost savings and safety benefits that can provide long-term protection for brands. The security standard in the cannabis industry is still evolving with medical marijuana focusing largely on healthcare safety and security precautions, while the recreational market is still looking to define both its risk and security comfort zone. In this time of uncertainty, it's important to understand which parts of your business you don't want to change, particularly when focused on customer experience. A comprehensive security plan serves many purposes, including keeping employee and facilities safe, protecting financial transactions and product inventory, providing peace of mind to customers, and creating a stable business environment to support sustainable growth. If a business has been robbed or appears to have lax security precautions, customers start to wonder about their personal safety when visiting these establishments. They might also question the safety of the product itself. Once lost, consumer confidence can be nearly impossible for a small to medium-sized business to gain it back. Today, the industry relies on a complicated supply chain to be in compliance with state and most federal regulations regarding zoning, growth, transportation, delivery, and sales. Consistency and product safety are critical to the protection of individual brands in this market, as well as the long-term success in the industry. The complex regulatory framework makes this especially challenging. Even companies with established physical security programs are starting to request complete threat, vulnerability, and risk assessments as part of their cost of doing business. These assessments look at the general and unique threats, vulnerabilities, and risks to each cannabis-related business. This type of assessment helps to drive discussions around the security procedures and provides a much-needed layer of comfort to the business owner and the customer. In short, it determines what you need to protect, what happens if you don't protect it, and how you can more efficiently protect it so that you can focus on the finite resources and the areas with the most potential business impact. Risk scoring is used to try and quantify a number value to help make results easier to read, compare, and understand. Data is collected from an open source, public sector sources, and of course, the business itself to help determine the threats, vulnerabilities, and risks of companies within the overall industry and environment. Typically, threats included but are not limited to known criminal entities who target similar operations, angry former customers, and disgruntled employees. 
They can also be based on the type of businesses or specific operation practices and location. Once threats are identified, a credible score is derived based on factors including proximity, level of detail, resources, true motive, and actionability of threat. For instance, bomb threats are often called into businesses, but they are unable to make credible determination without collecting details about the caller and a level of knowledge about the threat outside. Conversely, employee theft may be a constant credible th threat for any retail business warranting mitigation in any formal security plan. Once threats are identified, it's important to focus on the potential impact of each type of threat on a relative scale. Vulnerability is the organization's ability or lack thereof to anticipate, recover from, or withstand a natural or man-made event. Attractiveness of the target and defense strategies in place are typically used to figure out the level of vulnerability. Risk is quantified by multiplying the vulnerabilities of a particular item by the potential impact. Typically, most focus to put it into the highest impact risks and the most vulnerable risks. Once these elements are completed for all the essential business functions, facilities, and other high impact areas of the business, an analyst makes for an overall report of the current state, often including mitigation recommendations and an assessment. Some elements that should be considered as part of a thorough assessment include the physical facilities, intellectual property, supply chain, product quality control, cash management, employee protection, and employee screening. A professional assessment will also take into account the company's culture and expectations and any recommendations made. Many cannabis businesses are focusing on physical security models that allow for a relaxed customer experience, which for this market is nearly a cultural imperative with controls for safety and security in place behind the scenes. It's the theme park model. Guests see a wonderful experience while the staff works tirelessly behind the scenes to make sure everyone is safe. As the industry grows, we'll see businesses continue to leverage experts to help them manage their supply chains, assess risks and protect their facilities, people and brands. Building higher fences, hiring one more guard and adding more cameras may not be enough to mitigate the true risks in the industry faces now or in the future. While many security professionals may help provide security mitigation strategies, few will be able to do so with a true focus on helping you protect the culture and feel of your business. When determining who to work with, I suggest engaging the businesses that focus on both. Nielsen Holdings, the company best known for putting out television ratings, partnered up with Headset, one of the top data and analytics service providers in the legal cannabis industry to deliver and read into the US legal cannabis market for consumer packaged goods. Strategically partnering with Nielsen is pivotal in helping validate Headset's mission and the mission of the cannabis industry as a whole, Cy Scott, CEO of Headset, told Bazinga, bringing together Nielsen's unequivocal knowledge in the field of analytics, services, and headsets, breaking through cannabis market measure data will provide critical support in the development of the first ever legal cannabis industry within the U.S., this move comes as Nielsen steadily develops a full suite of cannabis measurement capabilities inclusive of strategic partnerships and beyond to help CPG companies monitor the evolution of the legal cannabis space and the potential impact of legal cannabis sales to better mitigate threats and identify future opportunities. The Nielsen and Headset Alliance leverages the combined power of Nielsen's consumer research capabilities with Headset's real-time point of sale for legal cannabis products in key legal and recreational states, along with Headset's proprietary product catalog, dictionary demographic, and purchasing dynamics. This relationship will bring unprecedented visibility into market-leading trends, highlighting segments, brands, and products that are resonating with consumers in the legal cannabis market. This alliance will also give into some consumer attitudes, product preferences, use occasional and future intent tied to consumer interaction points within CPG's categories. Collectively, this powerful suite of information will enable U.S. CPG manufacturers to produce more easily measured and predict the impact of cannabis on the CPG industry and strategize accordingly. The formation of this alliance dovetails Nielsen's recent acquisition of Cannabis Consumer Group, a leading consumer insight group that specializes in setting the impact of marijuana legalization on CPG consumers' spending and shopping behavior trends. Data is the second largest investment vehicle uh, in front of consumption lounges and behind multi-state operations intended to remind cannabis retailers and purchasers that are subject to the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act for their obligations given the sensitive nature of cannabis transactions. Ultimately, they're only supposed to collect what's needed. 
In some respects, it's business as usual for the private sector cannabis retailers who are cautioned that they should only be collecting the personal information for the purpose identified by the organization and that any such purpose has to be in line with what a reasonable person would consider to be appropriate in the circumstances. Moreover, cannabis retailers will also have to obtain meaningful consent from individuals before collecting their personal information, which includes telling customers what personal information is being collected, to which parties it will be disclosed, the purpose for its collection, and risk of harm. Which is funny because you can download an app and give them all of the rights and nobody even cares. You just keep clicking until you're able to get to that smiley face emoji, whatever that... <laughs> is giving access to all of your contacts and emails and ability to make calls on your behalf and so on and nobody cares. Here are five critical questions cannabis researchers and producers are asking in 2019. The increased legalization of cannabis worldwide has driven a corresponding growth in research and development. The industry has progressed from foundational products like marijuana flour, typically high in THC, the compound known for producing the high, to derivative products such as vapes, edibles, and even hemp-based non-psychotropic CBD. Remember when weed was almost certain to give you the munchies? That's not the case anymore with the industry moving into deep research on other cannabinoid compounds. THCV or tetrahydrocannabivarin is a cannabis compound that delivers an energetic and euphoric high along with appetite suppressing qualities and today can be found in marijuana dispensary products. More and more formulation technologies, which serve as a bridge between the active component and the finished product, play an increasingly important role in cannabinoid product development. Proper formulation strategies lead to product with increased efficacy, better dose control, decreased variability, and increased patient acceptance and legal compliance. As the industry grows and becomes more competitive, optimization of these processes is vital to maximizing yields while minimizing costs and waste. In addition, cannabis innovation is driving new approaches to extraction or post-extraction processes, which are often utilized to clean up the raw extracts or transform them into consumer products. The competitive nature of the industry coupled with the consumer demand is also fueling the development of new and innovative dosing methods that offer safer, more precise ingestion of cannabis. Most medications are prescribed with a particular dosage based on the patient's age, sex, height, weight, and medical condition. As an informative blog post from Canabo Medical Clinic explains, pointing out that medical cannabis isn't quite as linear because different patients experience the effects they need with lower dosage, while others require higher dosage to find similar symptom reliefs. The science of all this will be lively one in 2019, as we expect to see more research studies, findings, formulation strategies, and product development insights from science leaders online and in conference rooms this year. Ken Snow, co-founder and president of Emerald conference said the use of flavor additives in inhaled cannabis products require much more examination. Understanding flavor and the desired outcome within the constraints of consumer and patient safety is imperative. Variability in law of nature is not going to going away and it's critically important for our industry to look at proposals on how to best manage this. Here's some other questions that research and producers are asking. Here's five trending political, scientific, and clinical cannabis questions that are attracting lots of attention by clinicians, researchers, policymakers, and producers alike. So cannabis chemotyping, grammar, and symbols. Cannabis is an entirely new word for scientists who were largely unable to access the plant for research in the past days. The process of categorizing cannabis into sets by their natural product content is still a long way from completing the industry's nascent stages. The effectiveness of cannabis to deliver the desired outcome depends on the intention of several or all of the active ingredients found in the plant as a whole. Classifications far beyond sativa and indica designations are needed that connect with actual user experiences. Speaking with Jack Root of Analytical Cannabis, Peter Harrington, professor of chemistry at Ohio University, explained the goal of chemotyping as the process of grouping cannabis into classes based on their observed chemical composition, correlate these groups with desired pharmacological properties so that the industry can have some quality control over products and provide an avenue to achieve personalized medicine. Personalized cannabis is key to acceptance and the use of the plant by a new and cannabis-adverse consumer and the future of the cannabis industry. Chemotyping and cannabis personalization will be critical components of establishing cannabis as a mainstream medicinal alternative. 
And I will add that Europe definitely requires accurate dosing and the uh, proliferation within Europe and the world to get away from that stigma will require just this. There are concepts and controversies and emerging evidence. So if you thought the argument was over, the efficacy of cannabis was intense before, just wait until there's a more reputable institutions beginning and conducting research in earnest, especially when federal legalization of the plant gives more access to research. Questions abound regarding the true benefits and risk of cannabis and the promise for its use in fighting disease. Recently, the wild popular Joe Rogan podcast featured a lively standoff between opposite end cannabis personalities Alex Berenson, a former New York Times reporter and author of uh, Tell Your Children, The Truth About Marijuana, Mental Illness, and Violence, faced off with Dr. Michael Hart, the founder of Medical Director Ready to Go, a medical cannabis clinic in Ontario, Canada. In the end, both disagreed to the overall efficacy of cannabis. More evidence will emerge this year about possible uses for cannabis, but don't expect that to quell the debate. When it comes to threatening opioids, public health surveys have provided evidence for decreased opiate use with medical cannabis. The concepts, controversies, and emerging evidence from this type of preclinical and clinical cannabis research are being investigated and argued now more than ever. Regulating terpenes and flavor additives for inhalable cannabis products, just as tobacco evolved from its raw form and taste to accommodate a variety of other cannabis concentrates, vape pens, and metered dose inhalers have done the same. Regulations, however, have not been established for these. While similar policies exist for inhalable tobacco and nicotine products, applying that model for cannabis formulations has distinct challenges. Terpenes are incredible natural compounds that provide unique aroma, taste, and medicinal properties in plants. However, they can be dangerous and even toxic if vaporized at high temperatures or consumed in high concentrations. Thankfully, technology is starting to catch up with the products that allow for precise dosage and temperature control, ensuring safety in utilizing compounds like terpenes. Genetic testing to map cannabis effects with different users. Using the most advanced DNA sequencing tools, billions of DNA molecules can be sequenced in parallel for comprehensive genetic classifications of cannabis strains. The technology was designed to provide individuals with the tools and confidence to incorporate cannabis into their lives using the most up-to-date research available. Information is accurate, most importantly, personal and unique to the individual. Optimizing the decarboxylization reaction in cannabis extract, the production of cannabis extracts and oils for both medicinal and recreational products has increased significantly due to greater market demand brought on by the legalization and patient demand for a greater diversity of cannabis products. Most cannabis extraction processes undergo a decarboxylization step, whereby the carboxylic acid functional group is removed from the cannabinoids, converting the naturally occurring acid forms to their more potent neutral forms. In other words, it's this chemical process that gives weed its high THC content. The cannabis industry has a lack of universal agreement as to the optimal reaction conditions for the decarboxylating cannabis extract. Not only does the industry lack universal agreements as to the conditions for optimal decarboxylization, but there's a disagreement about which stage in the extraction process which provides the optimal result for decarbox decarboxylization. This discrepancy in the industry is a result of strain variances and cultivation techniques and environment, which results in its diversified chemical profiles, which in turn affects the matrix of the extract, preventing standardization of the de decarboxylization reaction. So until the OG Kush grown in Southern California is the same as the OG Kush grown in Colorado and Maine, the industry will continue to lack universal agreement on these chemical processes. Purchasing a cannabis-related property, here's three things to consider or not to overlook. The first thing to consider is the title. A previous owner of a property may have registered restrictive covenants or easements on the title to a property. One example is the restrictive covenants might be one in which the, it prohibits the production or manufacture of cannabis. An example of an easement may be one in which pro, would prohibit a purchaser from expanding the building on the property, or in which case a vacant land or by knocking down the previous building may greatly restrict what one is able to build. Always look at the title to the property to determine whether there's any such restrictive covenants registered and tailor this search to consider cannabis specific requirements. 
like in any real estate transaction, the purchaser's solicitor should always make sure that the marketable title to the property is conveyed to the purchaser free and clear of any encumbrances. This will allow a purchaser the freedom to conduct their cannabis related business activities at or on the property without interference of additional restrictions beyond any laws and regulations. Number two is zoning. In the considering the, the location and permitted use at a property, a purchaser needs to ensure that they will be able to use the property in the way in which it's intended prior to entering an agreement. A purchaser's solicitor must deter determine whether the zoning of the prospective property allows for the purchaser's intended use or if there are any municipal bylaws that would prohibit the purchaser's intended use. For example, if a purchaser is looking to purchase a property and to use a production facility, the property will need to be zoned accordingly. It'd be very unfortunate if a purchaser found a perfect space for production facility and found a zone for use that precludes that purchaser from using the space to produce cannabis. Another example is in the retail context where considerations of municipal requirements is at the forefront of licensing process. Each providence has set its own buffer requirements for the location of a store, ensuring that municipalities have not prohibited the presence of cannabis retail, ensuring proper distances are well maintained from schools, places of worship, et cetera, is of the utmost importance. And the last thing a purchaser should wanna do is spend more money or time, possibly multiple layers of fighting a municipality in order to get the property rezoned after spending potentially millions of dollars purchasing a property. And finally, financing. A purchaser, of course, will need to come up with funds to pay for any property. In most real estate transactions, a purchaser receives financing to help pay for the pro uh, purchase of the property. Typically, purchasers will look to the banks and or private lenders for financing. Traditionally, banks and top-tier private lenders were hesitant to involve themselves within the cannabis industry. While times are certainly changing and both banks and private lenders have started to enter the world of cannabis debt financing, involvement in or use of a property for the purpose of involvement in the cannabis industry will often be a hurdle, hurdle for purchasers compared to a move for a more typical industry or commercial purpose. As a result, as soon as a prospective purchaser decides to move forward, the best course of action is for that purchaser to start working on obtaining financing right away so as to not hold up the purchase and obtain a favorable rate. Here's six hottest cannabis products in 2019. Change comes fast in the cannabis business and entrepreneurs have to stay up to date on leading products to capitalize on the world's fastest growing market. Back in 2014, whole flour was by far the most popular product and naturally the technologies of choice for consumption were pipes, bongs, and rolling papers. Just a few years later, the most popular cannabis products are different than they were when legalization started. Today, other method, method consumptions are experiencing rapid growth and CBD has emerged as a distinct product. There are a lot of variables that make tracking product sales difficult. For one, cannabis is illegal federally, which means that consumption methods and data are regional. On top of that, the cannabis industry relies heavily on cash due to federal restrictions. This makes it more difficult to track sales, especially since normal business considerations like opening a bank account are not the same for cannabis businesses. The industry is still young. From an entrepreneur's perspective, this is an advantage because it offers an opportunity to capitalize on a brand new industry. But for statistics, estimates on growth can vary and can only take a few years of data into account. But with that in mind, here's six fastest growing cannabis products shaping this year's cannabis market. Gummies. Cannabis edibles are an increasingly popular method of ingestion. Specifically, edible sales reached over a billion dollars in 2018 alone and are predicted to be worth 4.1 billion in 2022. Gummies have been the most popular edible in Colorado since 2016, and sales grew 53% over the last year, with infused gummies up 43% for Valentine's Day weekend alone. Get your gummies while you can, because they won't be allowed for much longer. I don't think that the states are going to allow for gummies. Washington doesn't allow them. I don't think California does either, because it's targeting children. Washington State went so far as to determine which colors we can have, which types of shapes, um, and of course words. You, you can't have the word candy, certainly can't have gummies. So eat them while you can, they will not be available. But live rosin is on the list of products. Live resin is a type of high THC cannabis concentrate. It's made through a process by which the cannabis plant is frozen to preserve the terpenes, which give weed its flavor. Typically, live resin is more psychoactive than other forms of ingestion, meaning that you'll experience more of a high. 
Between 2017 and 2018, rosin sales increased 66% in Colorado and 128% in Oregon, though live resin accounts for a smaller number of shares in vapes. It now represents 13% of concentrate sales in Colorado, according to recent data, and will continue to grow in 2019. I like the idea of selling rosin because in Oregon a couple years ago, maybe 2016, all concentrate companies had to stop because Oregon didn't really understand uh, the difference between BHO uh, using butane or CO2. And so they just said no solvents can be used. And so uh, from a risk perspective, I really like the idea of having a non-solvent product just in case something happens, you don't have to worry about uh, any issues. It's a lot, it's more of a risk-free opportunity to, to sell concentrates in an emerging market or uh, a new state that comes online. You may not know what the rules or regulations are going to be in the long run. Vapes are, of course, another product. So for the first time ever, vapes are more popular than flour in California. Sales of vapes grew 69% by the end of the first quarter 2018, making vapes the fastest growing high THC cannabis product in California. More generally, cannabis oils of all types are booming market. First quarter data shows that CBD vape sales rose a staggering 106%, driven by consumers choosing cannabis oil over flour for a cleaner, more convenient experience. Emphasis on the convenience. I also will say that a one-to-one -one ratio, so a, a one-to-one -one CBD to THC ratio, so 30% CBD, 30% THC, is going to be the new blue dream, quote unquote. I believe that the number one strain or the number one product will be a one-to-one -one ratio of CBD to THC, and it will be the convenient factor, whether that's a joint or vape. I think those two products will be very close, right with um, beverages behind that. The more generally cannabis oil of all types is booming. The current CBD boom is expected to continue into 2019, creating an even bigger recreation medical vape market. And CBD tinctures are right behind that. Among the most popular CBD cannabis products are tinctures due to their versatility. A classification under CBD oil, CBD tinctures can be added to virtually any food or drink or taken by themselves, which drove the sales of CBD tincture up 112% between the first quarter of 2017 and the first quarter of 2018. With the passage of the Farm Bill, extracting CBD from hemp is now federally legal, though still closely regulated. So this means that 2019 will have an even bigger year for CBD tinctures and other high cannabinoid cannabis products. Overall, the CBD market is projected to be worth between 22 billion by 2022 and 130 billion, depending on a lot of things. <laughs> Chocolate is another product, though it's no longer the most popular type of infused edible, it's still one of the hottest cannabis products thanks to the, thanks to the rise of CBD chocolates. So between 2017 and 18, chocolate edible sales increased 166%. By contrast, CBD chocolate markets grew 530% in the same time frame. So keep in mind that the CBD chocolate market is significantly smaller than the entire infused chocolate market, though it will represent an even larger share in 2019. I think there's a big shift towards non-sweets. So even within the beverage industry, there was a lot of soda that's moving towards lemonade, that's moving towards water. Um, and I think you'll see a shift as gummies won't become long-term, whether it's CBD gummies or otherwise, they won't be on the market forever. And then chocolate is gonna have an alternative. So people are looking for more healthy options when you go in right now, all it is is sweets, all it is is chocolate. So you're not really giving the consumers a lot of options, but I think CBD will give us that data that we need. As consumers go to CBD, they're looking for healthier options, including edibles, and chocolate I don't think is going to be one of those. CBD gummies, both THC and CBD infused gummies are growing in popularity, but CBD gummies are the hottest cannabis product right now. CBD gummies are so popular that they're the third most researched food term in the US, Google in 2018. It came in behind unicorn cake and romaine lettuce, but ahead of keto pancakes and keto cheesecake. Specifically, CBD gummy sales grew 925% in a year. Growth is expected to remain strong as legal hemp 
provides a legitimate source of CBD, and even more people learn about the benefits of taking CBD in its most popular form. So almost all cannabis products surge in popularity when it comes to legal cannabis. The biggest question isn't whether the market is flourishing, but in which cannabis products are growing the fastest. The recreational cannabis market comes larger by the year, and within the states that have legalized cannabis, more Americans than ever are taking cannabis in its various forms. As the trend in 219 is moving away from flour and towards cleaner, more convenient, non-smokable forms of ingestion, edibles, vapes, and tinctures will continue to take part of the flour's market share in 2019, with CBD leading the charge. And with that, we're going to roll this one up. If you want to like and subscribe and share, please do. If not, I'm out.